Hello, everybody. Welcome. Discourse about nothing, episode 11, Eucharistic Ecclesiology. Today, I'm going to be interviewing, having a little discussion with Father Laurent Cleanwork. He is the author of this book, His Broken Body. It's about schisms in the church and the lack of unity in the church because we're all bad Christians and we argue and fight and we don't unify over things. Um, let me just give you a real quick rundown of what this book does. It is a lengthy defense and development of something called Eucharistic Ecclesiology. That is a particular model or theory that kind of does it disservice. It's much more wide ranging than that. Let's say it's an overall narrative and structure for how we understand the role of not just the individual Christian, but the Christian in the context of a congregation forming a church, and then how that relates to Christ himself. It is an overall theory about what the unity of the church means, unity of the individual with Christ, with their fellow Christians, with churches, as they relate to other churches, and then it specifically addresses the question of what makes a gathering of believers not just a nice get-together, but church? What is a church? And you have to answer the question, what is church? What does the Greek word ecclesia mean before you answer the question, what sort of unity are we looking for? What type of unity should the church pursue? The answers this theory overall gives go like this. Look, there is an archetype of the church called the eschatological church. This is the church in its fullness. It's everybody who's ever lived, uh, who's uh, united with Christ. And it is something that's eternal from all time. I don't know the med I'm not good on the metaphysics of this, right? But it's this ideal church. It's not just a mental uh, construct. It is this real metaphysical thing. Um this ideal church, and it is the standard or the archetype for how our churches are supposed to look. Individual local churches, let's say in a certain city like Corinth, are churches in virtue of resembling or participating in that eschatological church. On this view, what it means to be the Catholic church is just, that just means the whole church, or the church in its full fullness, it's wholeness. Think of it this way. The church on this theory is a one in many. Here's other examples of ones in many. Um, redness, the color red, or the property of having redness. My Ferrari, red. My face when I do a podcast and lie about having a Ferrari, red. Um, my mailbox, red. One thing, red, the property of red, being red, in many different things, many different places, many different times. Each of those things are fully or wholly red. Here's another one, humanity. I'm human, you're human, we're all human. Any Ocos back there, the charioteer at Delphi, that's a picture of a human. Here's some human skulls up here, right? Um, let's just say me and you, whoever you are watching this, we're both human. You're fully human. I'm fully human. I'm an instance of human nature. Now, am I a perfect human? No, but I am wholly human, right? So we both share the property of being human or hum the nature of humanity. Now, on certain virtue ethical theories, which I hold to and which are common in Christianity, my perfection would be I become fully human. I resemble the idea of humanity as much as I possibly could, the perfect archetypical human. Now the church, the eschatological church is the one in many. That's the standard, that's the archetype, that's the reality. And each local church is a church in virtue of participating in it, of resembling it, of having the same structure or being an image of it. So for the Eastern Orthodox, we, we don't necessarily consider ourselves one institutional church. Catholics do. They have a different model of ecclesiology. But this is one. Eucharistic ecclesiology is gaining traction in Orthodox circles. And according to Father Laurent, this is the, the heart of Orthodoxy, right? Um, this is the a truly authentic Orthodox ecclesiology will be Eucharistic. 
in that we're not one institution. We're a confederation of churches. We're unified in certain ways, politically, pragmatically, right? But more importantly, each local Orthodox diocese is wholly an instance of the eschatological church. It is uh, making that heavenly, perfect, ideal church um, instantiated in this world, right? Um, now, they, they're going to come in degrees. It's not just going to be you're the church, you're not the church. You can be more and more perfectly resembling that eschatological church. You can be less and less. It comes in degrees. And this has profound implications for how we understand the relationships between different Christian denominations and sects, right? Uh, for instance, and we'll talk about this explicitly later, a lot of people are arguing online about, do the Orthodox and Catholics really teach there is no salvation outside the church? What does that mean? Does that mean everybody has to join us or you're not saved? My bishop and everybody else I talk to that's educated in Orthodoxy says, no, maybe that's a change in opinion. I don't really know. I kind of almost don't care. Maybe I'm being a jerk. But um, it seems like the dominant thought is, no, you don't have to be saved to be in the church, but you do, and this is kind of trivial, you have to be part of the eschatological church, the set of all people, their lives, their faith, their practices, their beliefs, through all history, the only people who are going to be saved are those people who are in the eschatological church. Well, everybody pretty much believes that, right? But the question is, do you have to be in the eschatological church? That's how you're saved. Do you have to be in any particular earthly church to do that? Any particular local church, any particular institution? That's where the disagreement's going to come in. On this view, what it boils down to is it's hard. To, it's very organic reasoning here. It is hard to tell exactly who's in, who's out. We can't make that judgment, really. But we can reason by adopting this framework of asking, what does that eschatological church look like? What does scripture say about it? What does tradition say about it? And then I'm going to plug into a church that most closely or fully or wholly resembles that eschatological archetype or ideal. Right? This is a Neoplatonic doctrine. So it's not going to solve all of our problems. It's not going to settle these debates or disputes. But it is going to get, it is a powerful framework or paradigm for understanding what, how we're supposed to think about these things. And I, I, I buy it. I think this is correct. I think this is a faithfully Neoplatonic participationist um, view of what the church is. And that is very in line with the church fathers. People are going to disagree. Like I said, Catholics have a completely different model. They have a much more institutional model where to be part of the Catholic Church is to be part of the universal institution headed by Rome. Again, on this view, it's saying that the local church is a full church if it participates in the eschatological church, if it resembles it to its sufficient degree. That's what participation is. And um, that complicates things because, well, as we'll bring up, is a Catholic church resembling the Eucharist, uh, eschatological church? Could we consider them a church? What about an Anglican? What about a Baptist? If you adopt this framework, things become way less black and white. And I think I do. I personally buy this framework. So when you say something like no one's saved outside the church or whatever, there is no salvation outside the church. Well, you could always say, yes, that is very true. But... Um, when we're talking about being a part of a local church, it's more complicated than that because the question is, which local church actually participates in the eschatological church in your area where you can attend? And maybe things can get so bad in a Catholic or Orthodox church. Let's say the Catholic church is the one true church. Maybe your local diocese can get so bad that the only thing left to do is go Anglican. That's the only, Those are the only people in your area that you have access to left who at least in some degree are preserving the image of the eschatological church. I don't know. It's going to be context sensitive. It's going to be depending on where you are, what place in history you are, what your social class is, what your education level is. Complicated. Complicated. And the reason I'm doing this introduction is because this is kind of a, a this is a complicated topic, but it's, 
all this stuff gets boiled down to the stupidest, most reductive level in online discussions. And then you have people in good faith arguing there is no salvation outside orthodoxy. You have to become orthodox. I'll bring that up with Craig Truglia. And then a Protestant latches onto them and says, look how exclusivistic this model is. We'll bring that up with Gavin Ortland. Both of whose uh, Craig's and Gavin's videos I like a lot. But really reducing some of the theology, you know, really reducing some of this to simplistic stuff, frankly. And um, yeah, we just wanted to clarify that. So let's get to that interview with Father Kalina Work. Hope you enjoy it. Goodbye. One. And we're live. Right. Welcome back to a Discourse About Nothing episode something, a, a 10, 11, 12, I don't know, my own podcast, uh, what episode I'm on. But I'm here with Father Lauren Cleanwork. Uh, he has a PhD in, when I looked it up, it said Doctor of Science in the Study of Religion. Is that right? Yeah, it, it was reissued as a PhD later, but it was a doctorate uh, first. And I'm actually doing a, a second PhD now in a different field. But uh, basically, this book that we're going to talk about uh, was also a doctoral dissertation and also a peer-reviewed article, which was published in the Journal of um, Ecumenical Studies, uh, in which I actually elaborate a little bit more on some things that took place after the book came around, came out. But um, yeah, so it was an academic project to an extent, but it was also really a personal project because of my own life history. I was born in France. Um, I was uh, baptized in France in the Catholic Church because you must be baptized to have a godparents, and godparents are a, a an indispensable social construct, right? So it was to get godparents, you need to get baptized, and then you never are exposed, sadly, of course, to um, to the faith, to the church. So I really wrestled with religion later on in life as a teenager, and then you know, as in my early 20s. Um, but I was in France until I was 25 years old, um, except for a, you know a year in the USA when I was a child. But um, and so it was, where do I go? both geographically and spiritually. And um, I became aware of, of you know, the, the local nature of one's spiritual and ecclesial life, just by nature, nature of being, you know, sometimes traveling. And anyway, so it was a real personal reflection on where do I want to be? Um, I was eventually going to get married, uh, God willing. So what about my children? That's a real challenge you want to give the best, that's a very human uh, desire to transmit the best you can find about life and knowledge and uh, something that isn't going to be questioned and feeble and collapse and become a, a source of um, headaches eventually. So it really took me several years to sort things out because like you, perhaps like many, I was exposed to apologetics and I mean, popular apologetics and that meant you know, I'm right, you're wrong, here's my proof texts, all of them really out of context in a particular assumed framework. And that framework I realized much later um, was that ecclesiology uh, in which church means, well, church isn't defined, it's assumed to mean something. And when I began reading the, the actual primary sources, which I really began uh, seeing that you have to read the actual primary source, ideally with a Greek text on hand, right? Whether it's what a Greek strange text, thought that you have to actually read uh, that's things. Right. That's right, or origin or whatever. And so my view evolved tremendously uh, from being caught between the apologetics, you know, um, uh, was, was, was the expression, uh, Karebis and Scylla, right? Those two rocks that are trying to, to, uh, to suck you in you're right? trying to navigate and, and, and then discovering something which was new, hence, you know, a PhD proposal, it was a contribution, which was to 
adopt Eucharistic ecclesiology as you could say rediscovered by John Zizoulas in his own doctoral right. thesis in 1962, I believe, uh, at St. Vladimir's, but to then give it a new level of um, possibility and an explanatory power as what I termed holographic ecclesiology. So Catholic meaning yeah. according to a hologram. And what this opened up to me at least was in fact a much more satisfactory um, rereading of history and my own experience. And so we can talk about it, but so basically. So yeah, so let's, let's right. leave it there real quick. So that that's a good introduction to like who, and I like how we started talking about your background, and then you immediately launched into, well, the titles and everything that I've done and the work I'm doing now, really, it's all part of a process of I'm having to struggle through these kind of religious disputes and find my way into maybe a religious paradigm that I didn't have. And when you get in our contemporary society and culture that I'm assuming is fairly international from what it sounds like, when you are not raised in one of these traditional churches, it's a struggle to enter into that paradigm or enter into the world of these more traditional historically rooted churches. So you actually had to do work to do that. Your graduate work was towards that. You did have some other graduate work too, right? Like you did stuff. I saw that in the past you've taught stuff on like quantum mechanics and and physics and stuff like that. So you have a background in multiple areas. If you look at uh, Father Lawrence's email signature, it's like five pages long um, with the stuff he's done. But so this book in particular, what you're saying, His Broken Body, came out of your struggle entering into this kind of, I like to describe like my own entry into orthodoxy uh, as like you're trying to find a way into this rushing river and if you just jump right in, you're just going to drown and get carried away. But then you also don't want to stay on the shore because you're just going to be looking and not involved in it. But so this was, is does this grow out of your struggle to enter into it and, and to understand kind of where to place yourself into? Yes, completely. You know, as, um, as, um, so as a teenager, I grew up in a, in a nominally Catholic culture. Right. So there's everywhere churches, you know, so there's a real Catholic element to just being French. At least there was in the 1970s and, and 80s. And um, then, you know, comes this kind of searching phase. Um, you know, when I was a um, teenager, I was really aware of, of death and kind of tragedies because of my own family and so forth. Um, so I went through the usual, I think, you know, looking to the East phase, like, you know, what, what about Buddhism and Hinduism? And then then you rediscover Christianity, I think, afresh, which is great. So you, re you reacquire it by encountering Christ and being compelled by him. It's this, this impossibility to just remove him, ignore him. You have to wrestle with him, kind of like, you know, Jacob uh, in the night and you walk out um, wounded, but um, illumined, right? So that's the, um, but once you, take hold of Christ, then you have to say, where is he leading me to? And that's when I really discovered the need to go back to these ancient sources. I, I discovered they existed uh, in two different ways, uh, different, you know, influences in my life. Um, and, um, and so that's really by going back to the early church writings that I rediscovered, of course, this whole body of literature and as you know typically people who who embrace this uh end up you know on the uh, on the tiber as they say or maybe <laughs> some other river um and as you probably know and most people that have read this material realize it's complicated right there's actually uh, there's a pre-nicene church and then there is a, a post-nicene church there's um different different readings of certain texts um there's evolution in the way the the churches plural operate as a communion um so it's really there's disputes early on that you discover it's like wow this has been going on for like 
since the year of what 180, which is since the beginning. So there's a real need, I think, to look at all this material and to ask, I mean, what theory, that's a very academic view, is what theory explains this, right? In a way that ideally is also a, a Christian way where the mind of Christ is sought. What did he intend? What does he intend? What's going on? Um, and yes, there was this, you know, there's, there were two schools, you know, one w were right, meaning uh, you know, there was the, the, the Catholic view, which was very strident uh, in the medieval times, right? Uh, post Florence, so post 1500s, 1600s, into the 1800s, very strong, like you're not with us, you're basically going to hell. That changed, right. obviously, in, uh, with Vatican II. And then you also have sometimes pretty radical views on the Orthodox side. There's no grace outside the Orthodox Church, whatever that was supposed to mean, because um, sometimes there was an unclear statement coming from these groups that were themselves outside kind of the mainstream. Yeah. So I really discovered that the question was, what is church? Yeah, what so you, yeah. you are, for whatever reason, we don't have to get into it, you're drawn to Christ, later on you're not just raised with it and you say hey i'm drawn to christ well that means naturally i have to be a part of something i have to look for where christ is and then you realize well you want to start wrestling with christ to get to know him better you have to wrestle with his body and you end up wrestling with his body and it's just i mean from my perspective uh, what you're describing sounds a lot like what i went through it's really complicated his body is not very simple it's very strong and it's also in a lot of ways sick at times. Um, and his body, as the title of your book suggests, is broken. And now you need to know exactly which parts of his body to plug into or which parts of people who say that they're part of his body, a.k.a. the church, are really part of his body and which are not. And what does this all mean? And so to come to Christ and have an experience of Christ is one thing. But then to actually enter into full communion with Christ, which requires entering into communion with other people who are unified with Christ and the institutions and organisms that they form, complicated issue. And what it sounds like is you were exposed to this sort of apologetics like I was, which is very much, especially in modern times, analytic and um, very black and white terms. You're right, I'm wrong. And I think part of that comes from apologists have had to battle like the new atheists and bad pop philosophy for the last 30 years. But uh, so everything's very black and white terms. And uh, I mean, knowing this growing up in the 90s when this stuff was really flaring up and early 2000s with YouTube starting, like different types and sects of Christians at each other's throats just as much as Christians versus atheists. So that's overwhelming. And so you start to ask questions like, well, what? Where should I really plug into? What type? Where is Christ's body? How is it unified? What does the word church even mean? Um, and so eventually you work through that and you develop, you said this was part of your doctoral dissertation, and this book gives a particular model of what it means to be unified as Christ's body or what it means to be uh, the Catholic uh, church and how what model that's supposed to be organized around i and it, it's hard to say it, oh it's a model of just like the church because it's it's not just a model of how we should run our churches it's a model of what it what the church as an entity universally and also lo locally and then the relationship between the individual and their local church and the universal and then christ himself god himself it's a model of more than just what a lot of my Protestant listeners will think of as just a church. It's a model of, I think, the Christian organism. I don't know if that's a weird way to put it. And so you started working on this, and from your perspective, Eucharistic ecclesiology is what you're defending in this book. Where does Eucharistic ecclesiology come from? When did this start? I know you'll want to say that it comes from the very beginning, um, 
But where in particular, when did people start rediscovering this sort of uh, paradigm or model of what it means to be part of the body of Christ? So maybe the question is, you know, when did Christians um, forget or at least, um, you know, move from a clear theology that is, in fact, yes, Eucharistic and, and truly Catholic, holographic, as I call it, to a model that is universal in the sense of being imperial or worldwide. And so I fell in love when I was reading uh, ancient documents with Eusebius's church history, or better, ecclesiastical history, by the way. And there's a wonderful edition by Paul Mayer, uh, hardcover with maps and, you know, and, and, and images and statues. It's a great translation, very accurate, very fresh, very, very readable, like a novel. So I really read Eusebius because I thought, well, Eusebius is this bishop in the year, say, you know, 120, 125. He's given by Constantine um, a, a blank check to roam the empire, to look for sources, documents, archives, to write the history of Christianity, the churches, from Pentecost to basically Nicaea. Wow. And this book contains all of these documents that he has compiled, that he has basically collected, and he's just copying right from these letters, these documents. So what I discovered reading Eusebius is that he's talking about churches that form a common union. These churches are always local churches in a city. They always have a chief presbyter or bishop who is in charge, basically, was the head of the local church, the church, the Catholic church in a particular city. That in a region, which is what we have in the Bible anyways, right, we have churches, churches, plural, in Achaia, which is Greece, or uh, in Asia Minor, you have churches, not a church of Asia Minor. And sometimes you have schisms between churches that are out of communion for some time. The bishops have a dispute over some, you know, some issue, date of, you know, date of uh, Pascha, how to receive uh, the lapsi. Anyways, they, they... And you can tell in Eusebius, they, there's these schisms among churches. Eventually, they are typically restored. That's interesting, right, by the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, so that was my, my reference. So this was the model that functioned uh, during those, those centuries. Now, it's true that when, when the emperor, in a way, wants to unify the churches into an imperial church, to use that term, the Roman model of kind of this, the, this imperium, then the theology continues to exist. Uh, and you can, like Nicaea has canons that clearly convey this ecclesiology, but the mindset becomes more and more of a church, singular, a Catholic church, which is really the conglomerate of all these churches. In other words, which is what you see in the, the, the current um, uh, Catholic catechism, right? The CCC, as I call it, um, that there's this universal church, which is all the Christians alive today across the world. So not through space and time, just through space, right? Today over the world. Uh, and there's then these portions of this whole, which are these local particular churches. So there's a real sense of the, the whole, which is the universal worldwide Catholic Church, and then the, the parts, which are the, it's the diocese, whatever they call it. And I came to realize how this evolved from this imperial mindset, this economical model, how things should work. But this was not the theology, the scriptures, or the fathers. Now, this was really rediscovered as we discussed by John Zizioulas when he was a student. He's, you know, now a, a fairly famous uh, Greek Orthodox metropolitan and theologian who said, basically, the body of Christ is the church. So this is my body, is the church. This is my body, is the Eucharist. So the church exists or is, ma is manifested whenever the Eucharist happens 
in a particular place. So in, in practice, whenever the people of God gather around their bishop, presbyters, deacons, and the people bring the gift of the, the bread and the wine, they say, Amen, Alleluia, the liturgy takes place. The whole church is made manifest during this, this event. Right? So, so the, the Eucharistic event actualizes, manifests the church. And there is the whole church, there is the Catholic church. And it's very clear for those who actually read uh, these ancient texts that it's the Orthodox faith and it's the Catholic church. And these adjectives have a reason to be specific. Now, you could make a case of well, you could sometimes maybe, you know, go the other way around, Catholic faith, Orthodox church, but the, the pattern and the, the, the accurate way is the Catholic church for a reason and the Orthodox faith. Yeah, that's yeah. that's significant, right? So, okay, to recap what you were saying, right? Um, you're reading primary sources, particularly Eusebius, um, and you're starting to see, well, hey, wait, we've got the theology really early on of the church is centered around Eucharist, um, and that what it is to assemble as a church is to assemble as a group which takes the Eucharist, particularly served by a bishop. Right. But, and John Zizulis, you know, mentions 1 Corinthians 10, right. where St. Paul writes, when you come together as church, yeah, as the, the kind of a defining text, and you can see uh, when you read Ignatius of Antioch, his letters to all these churches, there's a real concern that only consider it as being assured, I would say, a bebeia in Greek or valid, the Eucharist, which is under the bishop or his deputy, in other words, you know, the, the, the presbyters. Um, there's a real sense that a, a Eucharist cannot be deemed assured, guaranteed to, to join someone to, to the body of Christ, unless it comes from this pedigree, basically, which is the apostolic and um, succession in the bishop and the presbyters. So having a bishop, what you're finding in the early sources and rediscovered by, I can never pronounce his last name, Zalal. Yeah, I have to see it just to say it every time. I'll link the book below. Um, <laughs> but essentially the idea is, look, early on you have this theology, the bishop, because he's seceded from the apostles, right, um, has this assurance and authority to reign to preside over the Eucharist, and that's an assurance to get you connected with Christ himself. And then what it is to be a church is to have that structure under a bishop from the apostles united in the faith and life of the apostolic faith paradigm practices. It's more than just doctrine, right? And that that's what being a church is. So church does not mean institution, worldwide institution, quasi-government or nation necessarily. It means a ordered gathering of individuals under a bishop to take the Eucharist. And that differs from what you were then seeing in how, let's just stick to Catholic because Protestant, there's no, uh, the vast majority of Protestants in my experience in the United States don't actually have a model of this because they're just they're not institutional in any sense right but just looking catholics what you're saying is the catholic church at least as it's been over the last several hundred years has not actually lived out that sort of theology and has adopted practically a different model of there is a worldwide institution or let's say set of all believers who are true believers and truly united spiritually to Christ. And that is the church and they are all unified under Rome, right? Well, we have two very different models now because church, the word church refers to two completely different sorts of things. Right. So you said to be a church, you need to have this, right? The, the, the presbyters among which is the first who is the bishop and so forth. It's more than that. It's being the church. See, it's, there's the church, the Catholic church, 
complete hole, lacking nothing in every town. So this really is what we see in the in the book of Acts, right? Is uh, and in fact, Eusebius really reveals to us really interesting information that sometimes we just don't even we don't not aware of it. So after Pentecost, the church is made manifest in Jerusalem. It's the only church at one point. Right? Eusebius tells us that the risen Lord Jesus Christ appears to Peter, James, and John, and he says in this apparition, this vision, maybe during the 40 days, but he says, consecrate my brother, meaning his, his adoptive you know, half-brother, James, not one of the 12, as the bishop of this one church of Jerusalem. And we can see in Acts that, in fact, James of Jerusalem, the Lord's brother, is the, quote, bishop. He's not called bishop, but you can see he's functioning as the bishop of Jerusalem. He's presiding over the the dispute, the council in right. Acts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so from which we learn two things. One is that James is an older man. He's definitely not, you know, 27. He's definitely more 50. So he's an older sibling by adoption of Jesus. That's interesting to note, age of James and age of Joseph. But that the idea that three are required, in this case was Peter, James, and John, to consecrate a bishop has its roots in this event. You can make the case that so the need to have three local neighboring bishops consecrate, not ordained by what to consecrate a bishop, comes from this pattern. Um, but you have early on this idea that you have presbyters, and presbyters in the New Testament, which means simply an elder, right, is the qualification. You have to be a wise, somewhat older man so 30 plus, right, to be an elder, a presbyter. And there's overseers. And that overseers is really the function, is to watch over. But it's clear to everyone that overseers and elders are interchangeable. However, we know that among these presbyters, one is the first. For example, James and Jerusalem. And in the really traditional churches, like in Rome, they kind of preserve this terminology, right? Where presbyter, ep episcopos, episcopal is somewhat interchangeable, but they know that among the presbyters, there's the first, a, a protos, a, a head or chief, which is the bishop. Um, so Clement of Rome is clearly a presbyter, but he is the first presbyter. And, and when you read, um, Irenaeus, for example, he documents right the succession of of bishops in Rome. They only begin using this term bishop episcopos for the first presbyter a bit later than the East. We see right away with uh, Ignatius that he calls episcopos uh, not just any presbyter but the chief presbyter, and this word becomes specialized, so to speak, uh, for for he was first among the presbyters. And so the idea in the in the early church, and we see it in Cyprian, we see it uh, in Origen, is that in the church, the local church, the whole church, right, the Church of Jerusalem, Antioch of Rome, the 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 first presbyter, the chief, the head, to use that term, holds the place of Peter. In other words, the the idea that the apostles are the apostles' successors, okay, that among them one succeeds Peter, that's a Latin idea, even though you will often hear it among the Orthodox. The true model of the early church is that in the church, the presbyters are the apostles' successors, and among them, a presbyter is not is not uh, ordained but consecrated to become Peter among them, first among them, head among them, chief among them. That's the bishop. So, so is 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 uh, uh, Peter then the chief apostle? Yes. In the Roman system, it translates to therefore the bishop of Rome 
is Peter's successors, the other bishops are the apostles' successors, and that's the universal worldwide church. In the early church, the model is you have a local church, the Catholic church, where the, the presbyters hold the place of the apostles, and among them you have Peter's throne, which is the bishop's throne. And that's exactly what is taught by Cyprian, for example, um, and also mentioned by Origen, who clearly says that the bishops cite Matthew 16 as their charter for their authority as, as you know, heads of the church, as chief rabbi, so to speak, of the ecclesia. So it's a different paradigm, uh, but what really was unique in the work that I was doing is that because I did some reading in, in science and in physics and I, I did some teaching in this area, I was aware that there was a paradigm in, in science called holograms. Um, and it came from a, a famous book, very popular book called The, the Holographic Universe by Malcolm Talbot. And he illustrates what a hologram is, uh, which is a way to encode a reality uh, that encodes the whole in every part. So using a holographic technology, it's a mathematical function, it's quite complex. You can encode, say, Princess Leia right into a, a flat film, and you shine a light or laser on that film, the whole shape comes out. Right? But if you cut the film in half and you do it again, the whole image still comes out, not half of it. If you cut again until you have a small piece of the film, you shine your light, you still have the whole Princess Leia, but it's just fuzzier. So this whole in every part is a really radical, profound, and I think fundamental concept in, in, in physics, in how we describe reality. And I thought, wow, I mean, Catholic means according to holies, to this holographic concept. And in a way, it seemed clear to me that though there was no such you know, concept from science in the early church, they saw the local Eucharist under the bishop and the presbyters as this kind of light shining into a place in which the whole church, the transcendent church, all believers through space and time was kind of actualized and in which you could join or kind of beam into the body of Christ. Uh, so that was kind of the, the transition, you could say, from this Eucharistic model from John Zizulas to, to say, well, it's really the whole church really is in every place. There is no need to, to add up all these churches to make another church, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church, or frankly, when we say Greek Orthodox Church, it, it's, it's, what does that mean? I mean, it's not a theological expression. It's definitely not um, um, what I encourage. Right? There, there's the Archdiocese of Athens and all Greece. Now we're talking, that's an accurate terminology. Right? Um, Patriarchate of Moscow, yeah, that's, that's accurate because it refers to a territory in which the bishops, the churches, have recognized a, a first among them and given particular powers to this first. Now, the whole debate then became, well, what about Rome, right? If among the churches, uh, one should be first, then since Peter, becomes the paradigm for firstness in the local church, meaning the bishop. Well, what about the Church of Rome? That's where Peter was buried. Should not this church, which is more Petrine, I guess, you know, in a, in a sense than, uh, than maybe others, uh, have the primacy among the churches? Um, and that was kind of um, agreed upon, you could say, by the bishops because of various factors coinciding, right? There was Rome as the capital of the, of the empire. Rome was the most generous church, for sure. Uh, all roads led to Rome, so it was the center of, of interaction and gravity. And then, yes, Peter was buried in Rome, and so it was the most Petrine, arguably, you could say at least, among the, the churches. So, um, 
the firstness of the Church of Rome and then of the Bishop of Rome, and the two aren't quite the same, but they're pretty close. So what does that mean? Is it is it a is it an, an episcopal power over other churches or not? That became a debate very very early on. Uh, and, and so when you read Eusebius even in these three hundreds, you can see that uh, there's a real tension over how these churches will will operate. Uh, typically, in a region, it was pretty quickly settled that there would be a first among the bishops in a region. So in Egypt, Alexandria, in, in, in Middle East, Syria, whatever, it was Antioch. And, uh, and in Italy and the greater West, Rome. So that was pretty well settled, those regional primacies. And they were established under kind of an idealistic model, right? That the, the, the bishop should know who is the head among them. That's, you know, Canon 28 of the Apostles or Apostle Canon 28. And the primate, the head, should not do anything major without the consent of all the other bishops. It was this kind of, this, this, this bold attempt to say, we're going to make this work with consensus, with agreement. Um, um, and then came the issue of not just the regional primacies, but also this worldwide primacy. And so there's, at the local level, is this divine primacy of the bishop. And then, kind of like the primacy of a, of a husband in his, in his household, I would say. But then you have these economic primacies, like, like Alexandria or, or Jerusalem or Constantinople, which are, you know, arrangements, agreements based on realities of geography and, and, and politics and history. And so we, we agree that these regional headships are economic, political uh, solutions. Uh, the question becomes, what about this worldwide primacy, the quote, Roman primacy or the primacy of Constantinople later on, um, are these divine or, or not, or are they also economical, political? Obviously for, for Rome, it was always, no, we have uh, a primacy that is equal to the primacy of a bishop over his church. So the Pope has the power, Episcopal powers over anyone, right? Over all bishops and over all faithful. Uh, clearly this was never uh, the Eastern paradigm. Uh, at the most, when you read uh, in the canon, say, of Sardica, you can see the Eastern, so the Greek speaking, but, you know, uh, the Eastern bishops agreeing, agreeing to recognize in, in Rome particular prerogatives, the way that agreed to give prerogatives to regional uh, primates, the way today... Uh, uh, the bishops of Russia has give, have given, you know, maybe uh, uh, in their statutes, you know, particular prerogatives to to the patriarch, uh, and this functioned pretty well until the time of Photios, until the uh, the tenth century, ninth century, um, and then you really have a a separation. But the separation then, if you, we have this paradigm, is not that there was one church for a thousand years, that there was one community of churches with occasional schisms in, you know, and in fact, after 451, to be frank, a large chunk separates in Egypt. Um, in fact, around 431 within historians, a chunk separates in Assyria, right? So you do have an imperial, you know, uh, body, which is called, called church often, but it's really churches that are unified under the system. But in 1054, two churches, two local churches have a schism. It's happened before with Eusebius, or you can read the, the, the other histories. But these two churches eventually drag in their, in their orbits uh, the entire East Greek, East and the entire Latin West. And in fact, from 1054 on, you do have some significant differences that become really difficult to reconcile. Um, you know, we've talked about um, 
I mean, people have talked about the beards and you know, and the unleavened bread, and but but there's some more fundamental issues that that do appear uh, that make it difficult to reconcile. But you do have simply Greeks and Latins, and eventually they do really separate into Roman Catholic and then Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, whatever you want to label the you know the Eastern churches. So that's perhaps a, a better way to explain this slow separation between these churches. Now, I think it's fair to ask, um, and because last week was Sunday of Orthodoxy, right? where well, we remember painfully that in Constantinople and in the area, the, 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 the people held to wrong beliefs about icons. I mean, they, they smashed icons, they thought that you know the whole theology of icons was just wrong and uh, that there should be no images whatsoever. And uh, But those were still churches, right? I mean, they, they taught wrong things, did wrong things, but the grace of God was still at work. I think if you were baptized uh, under a uh, iconoclastic um, bishop somewhere uh, in Asia Minor, you were still baptized. Right? The, this idea that in every place, every time, it has to be all perfect and right and right teaching and never any corruption or error. I think it's, it's just not realistic. So yeah. we understand yeah. that a church can be defective, gravely even, and still function as church, still join people to Jesus Christ. Revelation 2 and 3 is all about defective churches, more or less, the whole spectrum of it. There are still churches. They're still joining people to Christ until he removes right, the candlestick. Right. Um, so, I think it's it's critical to say, well, if in 1054, to use this this date, the Church of Rome separates from the Church of New Rome, Constantinople, there are still churches, and 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 in the orbits of these churches, where Church of Lyon in France or uh, in Spain, these ancient churches, there are still churches, but defects are growing and the question becomes at what point are these defects really just terribly disabling right uh where where basically it's just not functioning anymore um and that's that's i think it's a more realistic way to look at what's happened to these churches over the past uh, thousand years yeah so eucharistic and this is kind of what i was teasing towards the beginning when I said, this is hard to talk about because Eucharistic ecclesiology, it's not a single model of a single thing. It's not like I make a model of the Eiffel Tower. It's not like I make a model of a biological, even a single biological system in someone's body, right? Eucharistic ecclesiology is a paradigm, like you've said a few times. It is a, it is multiple theories or multiple models of multiple different things that overall form sort of a grand narrative that helps us make sense of how are we supposed to think about, let's say, the, the, the schism of 1054? Are there suddenly, is the one church that somehow magically existed for a thousand years before that suddenly shattered into parts? Is that how we should think about it? Or is there something more nuanced going on? And so far what you've said is, here's and it, correct me if I'm wrong, here's the core sort of kind of narrative of Eucharistic ecclesiology. One, when we say a church, it is a Eucharistic gathering under a bishop. Two, when we say Catholic church, we don't mean universal as in this is the set of all churches unified around the world at this particular time. Instead, right. Catholic means it's whole. Not whole as in the entire set, the entire group, but whole as in having integrity, right? It is, and, and I'm comfortable talking this way because I'm a philosopher, but I recognize that most people probably aren't anymore. What we mean by whole is to use like an example, like a platonic example, you have the form or let's say an immaterial blueprint in the mind of God, right? Of what a human is. Well, then a human is born. A human comes to be. 
that human is a whole instance of the form of humanity, right? Or put another way, I have a bunch of ugly suburban houses or something, and I have, they're all the same blueprint. Each of those houses is a whole, an integrated copy with integrity of that blueprint. So each of the, the, the original blueprint or idea of a human or a house, each of those houses or each of those humans are whole copies of the blueprint. They're not missing anything, right? So yeah. when well, you say- A terrible example, and I'm not sure it's a good one, is to, when you use the word Burger King, which is a singular, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> My local Burger King here uh, has the whole menu. You have yeah. the whole experience that can be offered at Burger King. There's no adding all the Burger Kings, right? There's a cosmic Burger King that is uh, manifested from the transcendent realm of space and time into my, <laughs> my town. But it's useful because you see sometimes when you say Catholic church, it can mean the local church, right? Or it can mean this, this kind of generic model that should yeah. be present everywhere. So there's a letter in Eusebius of the Bishop of Rome and the name escapes me at this time, to his uh, colleague in Antioch, uh, I think Fabian. And they're talking about um, people who wanted to be the other bishop, the, the alternative bishop of Rome, for example, or of Antioch. And as we know, there were cases where there were two claimants to be the bishop of a particular town. In Rome, they were called anti-popes, but really historically, right, we had the uh, a novation, for example, but they write and they say, this man should have known that there must be one bishop in the Catholic Church, not even in a Catholic Church, in the Catholic Church. And at Nicaea, where it's 325, and in many cities, there are two bishops, sometimes even three, but you know, typically there's two. One could be what we call a rigorous bishop, from that uh, novationistic, you know, uh, uh, movement. And the, the bishops at Nicaea are, <laughs> to use this term, hell-bent, they're really heaven-bent, right? Heaven-bent that there should be only one bishop in the church in the city. And they're willing to make these uh, alternative people, bishops, when reconciled, to make them, you know, uh, uh, what they call, you know, like, um, core episcopos like a second you know like a vicar bishop or or just a presbyter but they anything to have one bishop in the catholic church in the city we see it during the liturgy of saint basil which we use now during lent where saint basil was well aware that when he was writing these prayers there were two bishops possibly three in antioch his beloved antioch there was Miletios, whom he endorsed as being the in his view, the legitimate Bishop of Antioch. But there was another Bishop there who had been endorsed by, by the West, including Rome, then was Paulinus. Now, at the time, for example, Jerome, St. Jerome, uh, is in the region, and he's wondering, hey, he's a priest of the Church of Rome, right? he's a presbyter, St. Jerome, as we forget. And he wants to be under the Bishop in Antioch, recognized by his own Bishop in Rome. So he's an Apollonus. But uh, for St. Basil, who writes about it, it's like the, the, the Westerners don't understand what's going on, and they're wrong in their support of this, this Paulinus. And he prays, as we pray, cause schisms in the church to cease. Because there was a schism in the church in Antioch when he was writing these prayers. And, and historically, we know that eventually the, the two bishops agree that whoever dies isn't replaced, the flocks merge, and the church is reunified. And that's, again, the church in Antioch, right? That's, that's right. That's the right. schism that's taking place is there is, and I want to talk about this more in a second, there is, whatever the metaphysical reality of this thing is, I don't know. There is a, I think you call it an eschatological church, which is that the blueprint to talk about it metaphorically, 
And then the local church in Antioch is supposed to be one whole instance with complete integrity, a copy or an instance of that blueprint. I'm sorry, I'm dumbing it down a little bit because yeah. my audience are not Platonists like I am. Um, I can't talk about it, about it in the participationist language. But um, the thing that divides this local church is that now there's two bishops and that breaks, that kind of distorts or makes the makes the resembling the blueprint now incomplete or distorted yeah. because the blueprint and I'm a little fuzzy on this Christ is the high priest in the blueprint right right so so yes and I want to say that what you just described is exactly what Saint Cyprian is talking about when he writes on the unity of the catholic church a roman catholic sees this title it's like yes it's about the unity of the worldwide body in which Peter is the head. But St. Cyprian has no such ecclesiologies, which is obvious from his, his life and his, his writings. So the unity of the Catholic Church is the bishop. And the unity of all of these churches right, is that all of their bishops manifest the same Petrine office. Yes. Okay. So the blueprint, and I, I hesitate. The thing that I'm fuzzy on is that there's, if you have anything, when you're dealing in the realm of symbol or model, um, it's not that it's not real. It's that different. The same thing can be an icon or an image or a symbol or an archetype of multiple things at once, right? But is this right if I say Christ is the head of the church? And when I say church, I mean the eschatological church that is the whole church through all time, through all space, the church that exists right now and always has in a sense and always will, the, the fully consummated made whole church that will happen at the end of time or whatever, right? Yeah. Now, Christ is the head of that church. Underneath Christ are the uh, apostles, right? And then underneath the apostles are the people that the apostles lead. Now, is it fair to say that the problem in Antioch at that time is that because now we have multiple bishops, there's nothing corresponding to the sole headship of Christ over yeah. his flock, yeah. right? Now it's, there's it's, two Christs. Yeah, it's really fundamental because if you read the Gospel of John, which is this high priestly gospel, and again, Zizulas is the master of this, right? The one and the many, the many and the one. That's just a critical theme in the Gospel of John. What does Christ want today as the risen Lord? He wants, I would say, and it's and Ignatius of Antioch writes, you know, there's bishops in every city and every church throughout the world according to the mind of Christ. What Christ wants is for the many to become one in him. Because that's the ultimate consummation of the universe of, of this age. And so how is that done in a particular city, or a particular you know, uh, unit of geography, is when there is one bishop, one Eucharist, one chalice, one loaf. So that's what needs to be. So the idea, anyways, even when a town became so large, take even Rome, where the bishop could not really anymore preside over a single Eucharist because it would be thousands of people. Then, and, and as Jesus talks about it, it's interesting. They, they knew that we need to preserve somehow this unity of the church in a city even when the Eucharist has to be extended, not broken, extended. And so it took the form of, for example, uh, of course, the presbyters being deputized to extend right, the altar. In the Orthodox Church, we use the, the, the antimension, right? a, 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 an, an altar cloth signed by the bishop that basically extends his own Eucharist. 
Um, in Rome, they used the fermentum, a, a, a particle from the Bishop's Eucharist that was sent by runners to these parishes, to use that, that term. So there was this awareness that we need to maintain this unity of the body of Christ uh, in, in the city. Right. The many become one. So the idea, uh, modern idea, for example, of having multiple celebrations, Eucharists, uh, in the morning for the older people, and then with the guitars later on for, for the teenagers, and that is just completely anti-Christic. Christ right. wants, I really am convinced, as much as is possible physically, there'll be this one gathering, one loaf, one chalice, one bishop. Um, so that, so that's really an easy model, and we understand it, right? It unites people through race, through age, through economic status. Uh, in this, in this uh, one chalice and this one one loaf. And if you see sometimes some of these liturgies that are done in in the old countries, you know, you see a bishop with a huge consecrated uh, lamb on the path. It's huge. And an enormous chalice, and 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 they may actually maybe pour out into two smaller chalices. But so the, there's this this one lamb, this one body, this one sacred bread, and there's this one chalice that is then given out to the entire, to the to the whole people, and and it could take an hour to commune everybody. I mean, but that's the the model that um, that remains. Yeah. That's the mind of Christ. I think that's great. And I mean, your your link with the holographic stuff is an amazing. I don't know if I'd want to call it just a metaphor for talking about like Platonic participation, one in many, because that actually does seem to be some sort of metaphysical reality that's very yeah. concrete. Yeah. So I it's agree. not a mere image, right? No. Yeah. But um but so now applying what you're saying here back again to that schism, 1054, let's just take that one as the example. We have the Catholic Church, and that doesn't mean the universal again. That means a whole instance of the eschatological church, the eschatological template, an instance of it with full integrity, not missing any of that pattern. And then now when the schism in 1054 happens, what exactly is it, is it a breaking of? What exactly is it a unity breaking of on your view? It's <clears throat> clearly not a breaking of the eschatological church. No. How could that be broken? That's right. It's not a breaking of even a particular local church. It's not a breaking of Rome. It's yeah. not a breaking within Constantinople, no, right? Not yet, because eventually it will be schisms between local churches that are powerful often result in local schisms. So eventually Rome sends their own bishops in where there's already a, a bishop. Um, so yeah, so these schisms between churches can quickly turn uh, into local schisms as well. Eventually you have a, a Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, for example, right? So there's uh, now two bishops, quote, in Jerusalem. Right. There's three in Alexandria. There's the, the, the Coptic uh, non-Cacedonian bishop, the patriarch of the, of the Coptic church. Uh, there is uh, the Greek Orthodox, uh, Bishop of Alexandria, and there is also a Roman Catholic uh, or Eastern Catholic bishop there. Right, so you and have that's the type of schism that is painful and breaking the body, right? It's not two different local churches, one in Rome, one in Catholic. They're not talking to each other. No, I mean that sucks. That's not ideal, right? Yeah, but yeah. that's not a complete breaking of the Catholicity of the Church, is what you're saying. Yeah. So, um, can you pause or not the recording, by the way, for a second? Yeah, I could. I could pause. Yeah, no okay. problem. Okay, and we're back. Um, yeah. yeah uh, where were we? Uh, oh, well, we were talking about the what you're essentially saying is the schism between Rome and Constantinople. That's not a good thing, but it's not fundamentally breaking the image of the eschatological church it's not taking away the catholicity of either of those churches necessarily now it can't devolve into that right well certainly one the schism reflects brokenness sinfulness 
in these churches. Um, so there's some decay, which we know historically took place, I mean, catastrophic decay in Rome, uh, the, the famous pornocracy, okay, that's right before 1054. But frankly, it's not that much better in Constantinople. Uh, a lot of issues, uh, theological, um, church-state relations, you know, patriarchs being deposed and so forth. So it's a reflection of sinfulness and brokenness already in these local churches. That's how you get to this result. Uh, so the image is marred as it is, and as you know, as we say, I think in their prayers, when someone is ordained, the grace of God which heals or covers what is infirm. So the grace of God is always covering over like oil over this brokenness. Uh, so already, when two local churches are in schism, you could say the the image of Christ is altered; it's it's diminished. But certainly, I would argue that. The church is still fully operational. It still is uniting people to Jesus Christ, and in that it is infallible, right? This, that's, Christ is infallible. You are still baptized in that church. You can still be ordained. You can receive the Eucharist, right? You're joined to Jesus Christ, uh, even in that brokenness. Uh, but eventually, right? This schism of 1054 really spills over. You have the Crusades, uh, and the Latins go into into the East. Uh, they sack, they install their own bishops. Uh, so then you really have a, a destruction of even the possibility of two churches reuniting, which is in Eusebius, you have these little schisms, but he talks about, well, later on, you know, the, the bishops that came after they reunited, they, they, they just moved on and they reestablished communion. Um, and it was tried, Council of Lyon, 1200, Council of Florence, um, and those were really failed councils for many reasons. And then you really have two bodies, which are now called the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And even the Orthodox Church, as we call it today, uh, has its own internal brokenness, uh, which are not unrelated, by the way, to local schisms. Um, I'll oh, give you yeah. oh, You're watching it in part right now with the stuff going on in russia and ukraine yeah um yeah so, so to give, i absolutely see that yeah to, i mean to give an example of you know things that are just not right and just not just i don't want to blame people i just want to say it's just not right um is uh, uh well take my own church what's my church well first of all the oca it's not a church huh? It's a, it's a it's an archdiocese or metropolia. I prefer the word the name metropolia. It's a metropolia. But I guess you can use that if you use it in a Burger King sense as being a generic, you know, for it could be. But it's not a church. It's a it's a it's a an assembly of churches. The churches are in fact what we call now the diocese. Right? We don't call them church, but that's what they really are in the yeah. biblical mindset. So my church is. San Francisco, by Bishop Benjamin, I, I am, in a way, extended, uh, extending the Church of San Francisco to Eureka, where I live, as a deputy, you could say, an extension of this Eucharist. In San Francisco, there is uh, my bishop, but there's other Orthodox bishops. We don't have, even as Orthodox, one bishop in a city, we violate not just Nicaea Canon 6, but the mind of Christ. And yeah, there's also a, a Roman Catholic bishop who was first historically, right? So we can always discuss that. Um, yeah. But you can see that it would take, what, 20 minutes for these three Orthodox bishops to say, hey, I'll take Sacramento, you take Oakland, I take San Francisco. At least we'll, we'll have an appearance of a one bishop in the city, and they know about it. It's in our projects, our... Uh, we want to do this right, but it's just not done. Yeah, because so and, and this is something that I'm not I don't remember if you say this in your book, I might just be stealing this. But what just occurred to me is, look, when you are when you're talking about restoring a dilapidated house to match the blueprint again, when you're talking about healing a human's broken body to make them fully functional, like the ideal human would be, that is not a purely binary it either is or it isn't. It either is a human or not thing. 
that comes in degrees yeah. because it's it's a matter of participation, which most people analyze as a sort of resemblance. So if our if our local churches are Catholic in that they wholly represent or wholly participate and resemble the eschatological church, well, we have to, at the very least, start working towards getting more and more resemblance, right? We have to start yes. patching things up to get there. And one of those ways is for the Orthodox in the United States is no more overlapping bishops so that we can at least start to restore the pattern of the eschatological church. And even if we can't make it happen tomorrow, you could get further along. Let's say you have three bishops in an area. If you get two, one of them to give his power to the other or something like that, then you have two. Well, two is a lot closer to one head than three is. And it's not, a, yeah, and it's all, sometimes there's symbolic steps, right? Um, you don't really have to relinquish anything or your parishes. You can just, at least as a title, um, say, hey, I'll be Bishop of Oakland. You take Sacramento. Hey, I have a large Santa Rosa, I'll take Santa Rosa, or whatever, or, or you know, some other, you know. I mean, the bishop of the OCA in the West before Archbishop Benjamin was the bishop of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Well, I mean, it just, that's just not realistic. Uh, bishop Benjamin very wisely yeah, relinquished this title of Los Angeles, huh? all the more that uh, there was the Antiochian Archbishop Joseph there in Los Angeles. And it was a first step. I thought it was it was a good first step. It's really through, you know, there's really two views of church unity ultimately, and I mean here of um, all Christians in the world, right? One view is really institutional, um, and one view is really more spiritual. Now the two don't always have to compete, but I think the Holy Spirit uh, reveals uh, to to the Spirit to the mind, what is true, what is good. So by acquiring the Holy Spirit, that's how we foster church unity. Uh, it's when there's this, con this conviction. Um, human means, uh, organizations, um, often do not work because they're not based on the work of the Holy Spirit. They're based on often truly mental just gymnastics. But uh, the two have to coincide, right? uh, but what is the what is the glue in my mind of Orthodox Christians? It's a common spiritual experience. Yeah, the liturgy, you know, the, the, there's a, an experience of being Orthodox that is so similar across cultures and space and time that it it binds people eventually, right? Even when the structures sometimes don't really uh, do it right uh, temporarily. Right. I think and that does, model, just for anyone listening, yeah. that does mm -hmm. not necessarily mean complete uniformity in worship. No. Because something that I still don't understand is even among like we're part of Antiochian diocese of Oklahoma City uh, or uh, what is it, Wichita in the Midwest or something like that. But even within like the an different Antiochian parishes, there's going to be slightly different music. Don't even start talking about Ukrainian, Russian liturgies. It's the same spiritual experience. It's the same it's way brilliant. of life, but embodied in different ways. Yes. Um, so it's not, and a lot of people accuse Orthodoxy and Catholics of doing this, but especially Orthodox of being very strict, like, oh, it's very exclusive. Um, but there is a lot of wiggle room within this way of life that we could still be unified and have the same spiritual experience. So it's not just... You know, we all read from the same prayer book yeah. every day. But I just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Yeah. yeah. And that's a real question is, um, you know, how, and I'm still wrestling with this, how different can it be? Um, so I know the Catholic world fairly well. Um, I go back to France every year. Uh, I have many Catholic friends. Um, there's everything from the Latin mass people, right, to the very postmodern dancing nuns, so to speak, right? to, to give a real yeah. full spectrum, right? Um, sometimes it feels like two different religions completely. Right? Yeah. So they're under the Pope, so they have Catholic unity. Yeah. That's one model. It's, a, it's, it's being stretched to its boundaries, I think, uh, you know, 
in terms of even the liturgical ethos and so forth. Um, that, in my view, appears to be just way too broad. I mean, it's just, um, do we need to have uniformity of like, we can only have the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom? That's what it means to be orthodox. I think that's not a historical position, right? There can be, in fact, liturgical differences within the same liturgical theology or mindset. Uh, and I think in America, our bishops are discovering, you know, how that could be. I think that our Greek bishops, and I was I was in a Greek parish for many years, so I, I know uh, I know that culture well. Uh, the Greek bishops are discovering, well, you can have, in fact, you know, diversity. You can have almost like Slavic parishes in under a Greek bishop, and um, I think that uh, our OCA bishops have also learned to have Albanian, Bulgarian types of parishes. So I think we're learning. It's slow. Maybe that's just God's time, uh, how to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know enough about the, the kind of varieties within orthodoxy personally to say much more on that, but it is, um, again, just like we have one common human nature between us. We are very different people. Um, yeah. and now there is a range you don't want to go too far with that because like you were saying, I don't want to be so broad as to maybe have like the clown mass or something yes, like that as yeah. people point and out. And it, it's easy to overreact in theology. So for example, uh, Rome says, uh, uh, Peter is the chief. What do we do by reaction? No, he's not. He's just yeah. you know, first among equals. Um, so there's we can overreact, right? We, we see it in, in all kinds of theological uh, realms. Um, so I think we have to be to be careful um, by, by you know, remaining, you know, re remaining uh, objective and accurate. Um, my own view is that um, the, the 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 Roman Catholic world post Florence, even post schism, right, post 1054, 10, 10, 10 Council of Lyon, really focused on the unity of doctrine and structure under the papal office. That was their, their, their view, right? So the word Catholic as a structure uh, with a, really a single bishop, right? The Bishop of Rome is in fact, ultimately the only true full bishop in this whole right. structure. So that's one model. The, the Eastern churches, I think really focused more on what I call the ritual. If the ritual is correct, then the church is there. So this idea that you could um, uh, export a, an Orthodox priest, I know in Germany, for example, uh, was the right ritual, right? The right liturgy, and that makes the church, right? It, uh, so there, I think those are two extreme positions. Yeah. Um, to me, the question is, is always, where do I live? Where do I live? Do I live in Athens? Do I live in, in Rome? Do I live and to make an assessment of how much, um, you know, how much um, error, you know, we we perceive intellectually, and uh, um, what we think is ultimately supporting the mind of Christ. Um, I, I do think that post uh, schism, that the the defects within the Catholic churches became even more severe sometimes disabling than our own defects, which are real, but I think less catastrophic, less really cancerous in Eastern churches. We, we, as you know, you look at the Eastern churches under Peter the Great, uh, you know, under Peter Mohila, uh, councils of Jerusalem, we've had all kinds of our own issues. But it's true that in my own decision, you know, I could a lot more deal with those. I see more of a corrective, uh, the DNA is correcting this ever more. Um, whereas some of these defects that entered the Roman Catholic system uh, became really, 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 really even more severe in my, you know, in, in my sense. So, you know, for example, even 
um, the baptism, so it became, you know, by, by only sprinkling, which is not invalid. It's just that it's just really, it's a defect to make it. It's not full. And by full, I mean, it doesn't exactly, uh, I don't, some of these words you use, uh, I want to use have a different connotation that I'm trying yeah. to get at. It doesn't have the full integrity of resembling the ideal pattern. Yes, I, exactly. Yeah. That's a very good way to say it. You know, the the dislocation then also of confirmation, chrismation taking place so much later. And then you suspend instant communion to an age of reason. So all those have a profound effect. I think they are defects from the paradigm. Do they nullify the power of Christ to save through this baptism, this Eucharist? Uh, and and this confirmation, I don't think so. I think though sometimes it can get so messed up huh, that perhaps it is impossible <laughs> even for Christ to rescue this catastrophe, right? And you mentioned clown masses, where um, where are the boundaries, right? Theologically and liturgically, where things uh, where things break down. But you can imagine um, that. You know, in the East, there were also some serious problems. Uh, you know, when, yeah. when theologically, the, 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 the churches in Russia uh, have to submit to the czar as, as their ultimate or supreme arbiter and judge, you could say, well, it's a disciplinary compromise. It's, it's also theological nonsense, right? It just, it's just awful, right? Yeah. So we've had our own issues. But one in conscious, and conscience has to make that decision. You know, where do I live? Uh, where do I stand? Uh, how do I think I can best support the mind of Christ, the will of Christ, where I am? Yeah. Uh, but and so this is something I've made a few videos on in response to people, because the, as we mentioned at the beginning, again, getting pulled into the apologetic circle, yeah, into the apologetics culture, things become, let's make a nice table of theological theoretical disagreements we have about various things unleavened bread the filioque blah 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 not saying those aren't important they're very important it's yeah. just that the whole method of decision making is essentially like this look if you're a person and you're drawn to christ and you want to know where you fit in and where you should be where christ is make a pro con list of all of the kind of theoretical metaphysical doctrines and see which one you think is more true and has more check marks next to it than the other. And the problem with that is it completely ignores, well, one, mo vast majority of people are not educated. And even with my level of education, I cannot fully do that. Uh, I just don't yeah. have the time to read everything that's ever been written. Um, but on another level, it's ignoring a whole other side and frankly, I think the more important side of Christianity, which is a mystical experience centered around participation in God yeah. and the idea of we are trying to resemble God. And as a church, we're trying to resemble the ideal eschatological church as much as possible. That's messy. It's going to come in degrees. It's not going to be a thing we could put in a spreadsheet. Um, it's not going to even be a thing that an analytic philosopher like myself can really even argue about with my methods fully. So when I see people online arguing, should you be Catholic? Should you be Orthodox? Here's the problem with Orthodoxy. And they say things like, here's the official positions of Orthodoxy. I'm just like, Ugh. that's not the grounds of your ultimate decision. <laughs> the grounds of your decision are who is participating in god in the divine and in the eschatological church and to what degree doctrine comes into that but it also has to embrace the entire life of the church and not just the life of eastern orthodoxy but the life of your local diocese too um and, and so the whole kind of apologetic sphere is very reductive with that sort of thing and there's very little wiggle room and it doesn't matter if it's coming from a Protestant or Catholic or an online Orthodox commentator. It's going to be very, very reductive in that way. So what would you say then? Um, 
I mean, you're kind of, it seems like you're kind of starting to build up to this. You've said it in other interviews, but what would the relationship be between, let's say that I'm, I'm someone where the only church I could really be a part of and that has any sort of power and organization is Anglican. Now I'm Orthodox, you're Orthodox. I would like to ideally be part of Orthodox Church, but what if that's the only thing that I, is really a practical reality for me? Is that somehow it's not valid it, in that it has no power to connect you with Christ and you just shouldn't be there, so you just stay out in your house? What do you do? How do you make that decision? Yeah, I would not like to be in that situation, by the way, because um, <laughs> uh, because if you are in England, when all this is taking place in the 1500s, 1600s, well, you're in a town, maybe there was a bishop before, he still is there, you have to maybe kind of make some compromise, but you're still in a local reality, right? Um, maybe there's going to be two bishops, one under the king, one under Rome. You have to make a choice. But if you're in Wichita, uh, you, it's no longer, <laughs> right? It's a whole different ballgame, right? It's, uh, um, I, I think it's important to, for someone to grasp what makes the assurance of, you know, having a share in Christ through the sacramental means. Um, definitely, I would say that the succession from the apostles in uh, in history, right, with with the is, is important. So, obviously, if you live in Corinth, Greece today, well, guess what? I mean, there's been a a, a bishop since since the New Testament, or Thessaloniki, right, or or Athens. Um, or in all these places, uh, but say you live in uh, in Cairo, Egypt, right? And you have the uh, the Monophysites, to use that term, you know, <laughs> loosely, uh, uh, bishop. You have a Greek Orthodox bishop. Really, is, is it's Greek from Greece? You know, you kind of wonder, um, you know, what does Christ want, right? From me, uh, and then you could say, well, I, you know, well, intellectually, I really support the. Uh, the Chalcedonian position, I think uh, the Monophysites were really it's a grave heresy, uh, and I, I don't want to be part of it. Or you could say, well, uh, this, you know, I don't understand this whole thing about the, and this this bishop who is an Egyptian, you know, uh, there's this, they've been there, they see some true local historic bishop, you could, uh, it's the same liturgy, it's, really, uh, it's the same spiritual life in so many ways. Uh, it's very, very close. I think most people are unable to really explain what happened in, in, in Chalcedon and to articulate the whole the whole system. So, so that's a more that's a more difficult choice for someone like who's an Egyptian, for example, who actually, you know, is, is torn between uh, Chalcedonian and, and non-Chalcedonian theology. Um, the, the the Anglican Church in America is is a whole different situation, and we're talking about. Right. You know, very complex problems. Um, uh, I would move. I would <laughs> yeah. move. It's, a, it's a choice I would not want to have to yeah. make. But. Yeah. The, the Eucharistic ecclesiology does overall, though, give you a really nice decision-making tool. It doesn't make a decision easier on you for finding out where you should be. Like it, it puts more responsibility on you, frankly, if you buy Eucharistic ecclesiology. But it gives you a framework or a paradigm for making that decision. Otherwise, it's completely just up to prayer and hope that God guides you in a miracle, which he did me. But I wish I would have read this book um, before I was a catechumen, so I kind of had that framework. But but yeah, that yeah, makes something sense. Something that, that flows from, from the, the, the model where these two churches separated Rome, Constantinople with the 54, they remained churches, East and West, but with various levels of, of defects, right? Right. And some would say, well, it, it became right away so grave. But, you know, take a Pope Leo the Great or a Pope Gregory the Great, but mostly Pope Leo the Great. Um, he was pretty, you know, strong on his own primacy, right? So, I mean, he was an Orthodox saint, but he was pretty strong on, on his primacy, uh, 
so the, the, the bishops of Rome, they've held to this for a long, long time, and we got along with them. Uh, is it a heresy to believe that the bishop of Rome as a, as a some kind of a divine primacy or mandate in some ways? Well, I think Leo kind of believed in it. Um, uh, although you can read it in different ways, but was he a heretic? I wouldn't say that, and he's Pope Leo the Great. Um, Pope Gregory the Great had also a kind of a strange theology of a, the three P trine C's, of which he was kind of the, you know, the, the, the bigger one. But um, then you reach, of course, these excesses where you read uh, Roman pontiffs who say, if you're not with me, you're out of right. the church. Uh, now, when, that's a completely different model of a yeah, that, theology. That, it, yeah. it, it goes into, you know, uh, kind of a scary model. Now, we hold the place of God upon this earth. I mean, that's, you know, stuff you read in those encyclicals. When these orthodox groups in what is now, in fact, Ukraine, Poland, uh, want to join Rome under what, you know, called the, the, the Union of Christ Litovs, they had to say that, well, we, we finally joined the Ark of Salvation because we were not in it before. So right. that, that became this extreme model. No salvation outside the church. The church is under the Pope of Rome. Therefore, it, it became this, this, this mathematics of submission to the Roman pontiff uh, that we would say is radical. Right. Right. And it's not what, what Leo or Gregory believed. That's pretty clear. Um, That's a great way of putting it. So it, let's say you have a church that now wants to unify again with Rome. If you're going to, if Rome's not going to change their own teachings since Vatican II, you have to say, I was not in the church before. Now I'm in the church now that I'm united. Yeah, that used to be Maybe, the case until Vatican II. Now, it, since uh, Pope Benedict uh, and the Dominus Jesus document, whatever authority it has, because one of the great difficulties with, uh, with, with the Catholic view on infallibility with Vatican I is you really you don't have an infallible list of infallible documents, right? So you, you take them as they come, right? Uh, and, but in the current model of Catholicism, of, of Catholic ecclesiology, you, you kind of have this strange two-tiered model where you have the churches, particular churches, dioceses that recognize the full primacy of the Roman Pontiff, that's the Catholic Church, and then you have also manifesting the Church of Christ, these other churches, meaning Orthodox, that don't fully recognize that primacy, and it creates this weird two-tiered system, um, which is not what, you know, what Vatican I taught. Now, Vatican I isn't really a council in my view, right? I mean, it's, there was a council in, in 1870, uh, the, the Pope gathered all these bishops, uh, a war broke out, many had left. He signs a papal bull. It's a papal bull, right? Um, Pastor Eternus, that decides, you know, uh, that he's infallible. So is this bull itself infallible, right? So, yeah. uh, so it's really, when you look at, at Catholic material from the Tome of Leo, Right, for example, at, at Chalcedon, all the way to more recent documents, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge that mirrors sometimes our own challenge at Orthodox to always seek to, to reacquire the purest form of apostolic faith. And sometimes we've had this, these kind of captivities to, uh, to the Western system, you know, and then we kind of rediscover patristics with Father Florovsky and even with the uh, uh, with John Zizulis, with Department of John. So we always have to be reformed in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that uh, makes sense. Let me, let me show you a, a clip from a very popular YouTube video that I think what you're saying would perfectly apply to now. And so, and so just for everyone listening, keep in mind what we we're kind of just saying is look, in large part, until at least until very recently, the Catholic understanding was if you unify with us, you weren't really in the church before, now you're in, right? I'm not sure that's actually the Orthodox view. Some Orthodox will say that. And the implication is if there's no salvation outside the church and you are outside the church, unless you come and unify with our church, 
well, there's no salvation unless you do that. Now that gets messy again. There's a whole organic level of life that goes on in theology and actual practice of, of the Christian religion that is not reducible to what people say in a theological treatise. And then we have to be careful of that. But let's um, look at this clip, and I want to see your response to it along these lines real quick. And hopefully I can actually get, you know, the audio working and fed to you. We'll see. Um, okay. If I start from here, so can you hear to this? to me, those who yeah. try to defend... Okay, great. So, um, this is Craig Truglia. I mean, he's very one of the most popular Orthodox kind of apologists and uh, lay theologians on YouTube, having a lot of uh, conversations with Protestants and Catholics. This is Gavin Ortland. He has a PhD in, I believe it's church history, has a really good channel called um, Truth Unites. They're talking here about um, Orthodoxy versus Protestants and what are the reasons to be Orthodox, what are the reasons to be Protestant. And then Gavin's about to ask just this devastating question. <laughs> and we'll see how Craig responds. And I want your response to his response. Um, because this got a lot of traction on social media and was just kind of used as a bludgeon against Orthodox uh, theology. So here we go. And Orthodoxy by denigrating or cutting down the scriptures do a great disservice because the Orthodox doctrine is the simplest interpretation of those scriptures. And there's lots of other stuff that's great about Orthodoxy, right? Better worship, the better prayers, better spiritual principles. But we could get all, we get into more detail about that during the conversation. So that's pretty much my spiel. I'm going to put uh, Gavin back on and uh, hey, pick me apart. How about it? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I will try to pick you apart, but maybe a few clarifying questions to start off sure. with, and then I'll give a few, a few responses. Um, First, just, you know, in my opening comments, I um, represented kind of what I have understood to be the historic Orthodox view on various things, particularly with respect to salvation. I guess I'd be curious for your take on that. I don't want to put words in your mouth or misrepresent your position, but um, do, so do you, do you think I'm damned to hell? Do you think C.S. Lewis is in hell? Do you think Tolkien is in hell? I mean, is, you know, do you hold to the historic hardline Cyprianic Orthodox view? Absolutely. That's that was the main reason my wife and I converted to Orthodoxy. Because we're going to hell. <laughs> well, yes, actually, and that may not be good, right? It's better to be motivated by love than fear. But that's what initially got us on that road. Yeah, that'd be. Okay, I want to point out a couple things about this clip real quick um, before I have you respond. First. Uh, Craig is a layman. He's a layman, not to denigrate layman, but um, no authority, no official authority there. Just FYI, everybody. Two, um, notice how the framing of this whole question is, do you believe I'm damned to hell? That's pretty crazy. Um, but also, Gavin says the hardline historical orthodox position, as if... There's a centralized authoritative teaching arm, and in the catechism it says, no salvation outside the church, and this is exactly what the term church, salvation, and outside mean. Mm -hmm. And there's only one. And so it's just already just, oh my God, the number of assumptions here. But, and then, but Craig buys into this, and I think this betrays something about his and other Orthodox converts' mindsets, especially Americans, is... Well, yeah, that is a historic view of the church, a.k.a. the presupposition is there is a single historic view on exactly what they meant. So with that framing in mind, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, actually, I uh, will start by saying that I think the statement, uh, no salvation outside the church, is correct theologically. What that means, biblically, is at the end of this age— and it's really um, Hebrews chapter 1, I think, that conveys that, that idea. Everything is rolled up like an old, you know, uh, clothing and like an old parchment. Uh, Hebrews, uh, you know, 1 uh, verses 10 through 12, citing uh, Psalms. And 
but you, O oh Lord, remain. So only Jesus Christ, you could, you could say, survives this age, passes through this age. And the typology, of course, is Moses, who is passing through the Red Sea. The elements collapse behind him. But he, Moses, and those who are in Moses, baptized in Moses, survive. So at the end of the age, the universe kind of is rolled up, collapses. And who passes through? Christ and those in him. So no salvation outside being there, hidden in Christ. That's And I is that the, the eschatological church? So that's, that's obviously what it is. Now, Christ clearly established, and that's the language of Ignatius, a, an assured an assured means by which we are assured, I think it's a wonderful term, by God our Father, that we are in Christ. And this assured mechanism is the mysteries of the church, right? Um, so say that my, my son uh, 12 uh, dies tomorrow hit by a car. Well, the Father in heaven wants me as a father to be assured that my son is in Christ. And he has given me all these means by which I've seen this take place. He was baptized, he was immersed, he was chrismated, he was communed, he received, right? So I have seen his unity with Christ so many times in such powerful ways that I'm at peace at his funeral, right? Um, and I think that's what God has given us. He's given us this this, this assured way to know we have peace with him in Christ Jesus. And we should pursue this, right? And we should encourage people to pursue it. Now, the question whether C.S. Lewis, an Anglican, <laughs> and uh, Tolkien are in hell, it would make hell attractive for too many uh, people to, uh, <laughs> to... But you see, they were members of local churches, and those were effective to some extent, right? We've discussed that. Um, do, do I think that they were, especially back then, so defective as to be unable to, to unite people to Jesus Christ? I would not go, go there. I think, in fact, that there's theology and there's your personal encounter with Christians, right? people who love God, who serve God, and uh, who through defective structures, churches, uh, still clearly manifest the unity with, uh, with, with Christ uh, and uh, in the work of the Holy Spirit to save us in spite of our own uh, brokenness. So I think we should really pursue the mind of Christ. I don't think we should uh, seek to be in a defective structure. We should really seek what we, we believe in, in, you know, guided by God is, is the, the least effective, the, the closest to, to his model. But I think to, to condemn people is, is very dangerous to also to, to ascribe to, to evil what, in fact, God is doing is, is, is I think, very dangerous, right? It's the, yeah. uh, what the, the Jews uh, did to Jesus, you know, you, you spell demons by, by Beelzebub, and that was, I think, an unfor unforgivable sin. So I think, too, we have to be very careful. Um, even St. Augustine, you know, sometimes gets a bad rap, but he said, oh, the church, you know, how many wolves within and how many sheep without without you know, so, but um so there's a short way to be joined to christ huh? and we should pursue that uh that's what i would say yeah i like to, i mean i completely agree with you i mean i have not hid this i i buy eucharistic ecclesiology and the way i'd put this in even simpler terms is look there is no salvation outside the eschatological church i have never met a christian a baptist a catholic who would disagree with that but the question is then, well, okay, the eschatological church, yes, that is a reality. It's not necessarily an institutional concrete thing right here in this one place. But um, let's say that the Orthodox are correct and that our um, local churches are Catholic in the sense that they are whole instances of that ideal. Um, well... If you have a whole instance of the ideal, and then you look at it and go, that's a load of crap, 
you're rejecting the ideal by rejecting the instance of it. If you hate a, a, another human being and, and see that this human being has absolutely no worth, in a sense, you hate all of humanity. If you take a photograph of a beautiful object, let's say it's a beautiful tree, and then you show a bunch of people the tree and they all go, I hate that photograph, right? That you show them the photograph and they go, I hate it. They're rejecting the tree, not just yeah. the photograph. And so you can extend that in a sense, if somebody wholeheartedly rejects and hates everything we do, then yeah, maybe I won't say for sure, of course, I don't think anyone should, but maybe they are rejecting the Eucharistic uh, church or the eschatological church and getting away from it. And then they're outside. But that's, it's a complicated issue of whether the political, social, temporal realities that you live in are able yeah. to take you away like that. You, you know, it's, it's uh, very difficult if, if a dear friend of yours uh, who's a Christian goes to an assembly, I don't call it a church, uh, typical assembly today where there's kind of a rock concert and a good sermon, maybe even it's pretty decent teaching, but there's no Eucharist, uh, doesn't even pretend to have one, or it's just so defective as to be, you know, to use the term invalid, or has minimal assurance of being what it's supposed to be, then I mean, there's a duty to say to such a person, hey, I mean, we need, we need this Eucharist. Right. Biblically, and, and uh, you know, from everything you can read historically, to be united to Christ, we need to be baptized, you know, and so uh, we desire to bring people into this assurance which God the Father wants to give his children. It's, uh, it, that's our duty to, 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 to not just say, hey, what's well, fine, you know, people go wherever they want to do, and it's, uh, but to really present uh, the most pristine possible uh, model of, of the church. Yeah. And to wrap this all up, yeah. Eucharistic ecclesiology is encouraging people to think more in terms of the old, more Eastern participationist worldview where you're trying to resemble God or resemble these models, and it, it does come in degrees, than a more uh, modern, contemporary, analytic, um, purely mechanical view of the world in which everything's either a one or a zero. It's off or not. It's true or it's false. There's no ascetic resemblance. There's no sim symbols and archetypes and living up to an ideal. Um, it's very mechanical. It's really recovering the biblical model mindset of what church and churches is all about. And you know, the, yeah. I'm out of time myself, but an at 9-11 is in fact found in Greek, Catholic Ecclesia for the first time. It's actually, it's a biblical expression, Catholic church. And it's one of these rare passages with a major variant. It's either the churches throughout Judea or the church throughout Judea. You can see why the copyists really struggle. Judea is not a town, it's a region. It must be yeah. churches. But the Greek of St. Luke, I think may, may have been the singular, the Catholic church throughout Judea. It's that archetypal, you know, transcendent model that is able to be manifest in, in different places in its fullness. It has that property of being whole in every part. So it's really recovering the biblical mindset, the mind of Christ, and then be able to look at the world today, I think with that mindset, and I think it's a, it's a better, more peaceful, uh, more realistic mindset that is more uh, prone to, to help us be aligned with, with Christ, what he wants us to do and to say today, and, and not to fall into these these Western-minded models, which are not biblical, and I think are, in, in the end, quite destructive. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I think All that's right. a great way to, a great place to leave it. I don't want to eat up All too right. much of your time. But um, thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for uh, coming on. And uh, maybe we could do something like this again. All I would right. like to hear about, in the future, your catechism project as well. So sure. I'll link to your website and everything. But thanks again, Father Laurent. Thank I you. appreciate you talking with me. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, God bless you. you.